I'm back with uh, attorney Marina Medvin. We're talking about uh, January 6 cases and specifically here about a Midland, Texas florist named Jenny Cudd. Um, Marina, one of the techniques or tactics that was used by the government is they were trying to uh, tie uh, Jenny Cudd with another woman named Aleel Rosa. Now, apparently they had some video of these two characters walking together, walking in and perhaps walking out. And so they they charged them jointly, evidently with a, an attempt to sort of make one person's actions be also uh, pinned on the other. Uh, and you helped to sort of uh, disentangle that. Talk a little bit about how the government here is playing fast and loose by trying to take A and B and imply that A and B are conspiring together when A and and be never met before and just happen to be walking in the same place at the same time. Well, th these two individuals, Mr. Elio Rosa and Ms. Jenny Cudd, uh, did happen to know each other from a prior protest, but they had no plans to come to the Capitol together. They certainly had no plans to enter that uh, Capitol building. They were at the protest. They saw each other there. Uh, one entered Mr. Elio Rosa and followed a few seconds later by Ms. Jenny Cudd and the two of them were in the building or in the same areas. They're not jointly conversing or making a plan to do anything together, but the government charged them together. Now, there is a benefit to the government when they're charging two people together. And first of all, as far as proving a case, it's this idea of where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, there's a little, two people doing this. They must have had a plan or this implication of some kind of conspiracy, even though they're not charged with a conspiracy. So there's this implication by charging them together, uh, but also how they're able to use evidence. So in this case, Mr. Elio Rosa uh, went to the FBI and made a statement. And uh, the statement truly wasn't that incriminating, uh, certainly not against Ms. Cudd. If anything, it separated the two. But nonetheless, the idea was that the government could introduce that statement against the two of them at trial. So also against Ms. Cudd, because she's a trial with him. But she wouldn't be able to cross-examine Mr. Rosa as a result. She wouldn't be able to point out any issues wrong with the things he said, because he doesn't have to take the stand as his own trial. But if they have separate trials and that statement is attempted to be used against Ms. Cudd, we would be able to object and Mr. Rosa would have to take the stand and my client would have the right to cross-examine the witness against him. And that is a much more fair right to be able to uh, show the jury, if we were to have a jury trial, to show them uh, the true nature of the statement where it's coming from and any issues with that statement. So by the government joining cases together, the government makes it easier for them to convict both of the defendants than if they had to try them separately. So it's an advantage to the government. Marina, listening to you, I mean, it's, it, it's so clear to me how important it is for these defendants to have good counsel, because these are arguments that have to be pressed uh, before these judges and made in a sophisticated way. And that's something you've been doing. Let's pivot to uh, an important um, uh, claim that you made, uh, I think, in the connection of this case, uh, which was you challenged the venue. You basically said, listen, uh, you can't just take these defendants and put them up before a kind of D.C. jury because these guys have been poisoned against these defendants. Uh, talk a little bit about what you said. I have a, an excerpt from your, from your filing, but I'd like, it, I'd like you to describe what the argument was essentially for moving the trial outside of D.C. You suggested in this case, let's move it to Texas. Why? The D.C. jury pool is exceptionally biased. It is the most biased jury pool in the United States of America. So the way that the federal courts are set up, each federal court will draw a jury from uh, the localities and there'll be multiple jurisdictions usually. And D.C. just draws from D.C. And so we just have D.C. jurors. So first of all, that jury pool is very small. And second of all, uh, the individuals in that pool are exceptionally biased, especially for a case like this. Uh, it was over 95 percent, I believe, was the statistic. Over 95 percent voted against Donald Trump. Of course, the primary issue in this case is Donald Trump supporters. So you have an individual who's advocating on behalf of Donald Trump. You have a woman who's wearing a Trump flag as a cape in this case. Uh, that's how she was dressed. And you have 95 percent of D.C. who voted against Donald Trump. And they did that in two elections, uh, 2016 and 2020. So normally when you, uh, as a lawyer, try to change venue, you're going to do a variety of polls to try and figure out well, what do the locals believe. In this case, we had the biggest poll of all, right? We had the election, we had the election for president. 
So we had two exceptionally large polls already on the record, right? And we knew what the DC jury pool already believed. And so you're full of uh, people who will likely disagree with your client politically just to begin with. Then you have to uh, say that, oh, well, they'll be fair. Okay, well, then let's look at what percent of those people are employees of the federal government, because they would have a conflict of interest here as well, right? Because the federal government's prosecuting these individuals and these individuals stepped on federal property. And uh, that's a large chunk as well. And so we talked about eliminating based on a variety of questions, we presented a variety of questions that we would pose to a jury. And we started eliminating people from that. And then at the end of the day, the question is, well, how many jurors that can be fair are left? And we don't believe there are any. We don't believe that it is possible to put together a fair jury panel for these defendants. And we drafted that motion back in March. And we used a lot of the local publicity in Washington, D.C. against Ms. Cudd. They have honed in on Ms. Cudd locally in D.C. And they were making uh, a huge fuss about her being able to go to Mexico on a vacation. It was a, a big deal for them, even though that's actually a routine motion that's done in criminal cases when someone's facing misdemeanor charges that they are allowed to travel and simply need to seek permission of the court. It's a routine motion and it's done very commonly, but it became a big deal just because the media made it a big deal. Uh, but they kept honing in on her and playing her videos over and over again because of the bombastic language that she used in her videos. It, it was just interesting story for the media. And uh, because of all the media attention she received, it, it, the local jury pool knew her personally. And uh, the issue again remained, well, the way the media is presenting her and the way that the individuals who reside in DC have been personally penalized by January 6th. Now these are individuals, and we put a bunch of maps in there. These are individuals who couldn't travel freely. These are individuals who were subjected to constant national guard around them. Uh, if you look at their maps and roads, they had to uh, basically see fencing everywhere they traveled in a lot of the uh, regions around the Capitol and a lot of the public buildings for months. So this impacted local Washington, D.C. residents personally. And so each of them was personally impacted. And now we're saying, well, let's try and have you judge this fairly. How is that going to be fair? How are we going to find that fair jury? And we also presented and this memorandum that we filed that, that took weeks to put together, but also presented uh, psychological experiments with individuals who claim they can be fair and uh, scientific showings that even individuals who think they can be fair at the end truly cannot when they're personally impacted. And that's what we were able to show in this memorandum. Now, one uh, one uh, factor you never mentioned, and probably it's prudent not to mention it, but nevertheless, uh, I like to mention these kinds of things. Isn't it also a fact that you basically got, you know, to be honest, a kind of a black city? You've got an overwhelmingly black population in D.C. And the reason I mention this is because of the media portra portrayal of the January 6th defendants. Oh, they're white supremacists. Oh, they're racist. Their motivation for going to the Capitol wasn't just to challenge the election, but was to somehow promote their, their Confederates, their little Robert E. Lees. I mean, think about the effect of saying that in front of a black jury. Uh, isn't that another poisonous factor that you would have to add to this already comprehensive mix that you've given us? The race of an individual juror should not be considered when picking a jury. Uh, but that being said, actually, the data that we put into our memorandum focused on white individuals and white guilt and how they viewed other white individuals like Ms. Cudd. Um, and so in that sense, we use race, but in a different way. And it wasn't black jurors that we were concerned with. It was actually white liberal jurors that were of concern to us in our memorandum. We were discussing the psychology and various experimentation that's already taken place uh, and studies that have been uh, conducted for white liberals and how they view poor white defendants. And there is quite a bit of bias that they have towards uh, white defendants who they see as conservatives and who they disagree with. And they are actually very unforgiving to those individuals. And so the bias would actually come from white liberals. That's actually fascinating. Hey, Marina, thanks very much for joining me um, uh, for an eye-opening conversation. Thank you, Dinesh.